Hi ho, Kermit the Frog here, and uh, Susan and I are just sitting here, and we're going to do a, a very favorite song for you. It's a time-honored old chestnut, that old favorite song that we all know and love so well, and it's called... Uh, um, three of these things belong together. Uh, three of these things belong together. Hit it! Right. <clears throat> okay. You're I'll do the, the first, first part verse? of it. Okay. Yeah, and then you'll do the next part. After the other. All right. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Okay, everybody ready? Now take a look there. See? See that stuff there? Okay, now three of these things belong together. Three of these things are kind of the same. But one of these things just doesn't belong here. And now it's time to play our game. It's time to play our game. Okay, now look at there. And we got a hammer. And we got uh, a shoe. And pliers. And a saw. Okay? All right, now. Hey, Can you guess that? which thing? Just doesn't belong. By the time I finish my song, okay. I'm gonna finish my song. Go ahead, Kermit. All right, here we go. Now one of these things. Oh, just I, I did the wrong part. Yeah. One of these things just doesn't belong here. Tell me, did you guess which one? If you guessed this thing just doesn't belong here, oh, you're absolutely right. And now my song is done. Right? Right. Everybody guessed that? We right. guessed the shoe, right? Everybody got the shoe? Yeah, but Kermit, right. why doesn't the shoe belong here? Oh, wow, you see, because uh, the other three things there are all tools. Are you see? all tools. Yeah, right. the hammer and the, uh, and the pliers and the saw, those are all tools. And a shoe is not a tool. A shoe is something that you wear on your foot. Well, very right? good. How many of you guessed the shoe? Most of you good. I'm sure some of you got it wrong, but that's okay. How many of you remember that little thing from Sesame Street back in the day? I remember that when I was a kid. I did a little search to, uh, yesterday of, of all the cartoon and kids' channels available to, to the kids these days, and there was like 42 different channels that, that you could get to. But for me, it was Sesame Street. It was PBS. And I remember watching that when my mom would be working on cross-stitching or sewing projects in the easy chair, and I'd be watching that during the weekday before I started going to school. And so I, I really liked that. That was one of the things that stuck out to me. One of these things is not like the other. Which one is not like the other? And sometimes it was really obvious, like a shoe or instead of a hammer, or sometimes it was something different. But the reason that I wanted to play that video and remind you of that Sesame Street game today is that I think we may play that game with what we do when we gather on Sunday mornings. Think about the things that we do on Sunday mornings. Here, here's some things that we typically do every Sunday that we gather. We typically read Scripture every Sunday morning. Somebody does it, or we have a video that's, being, that's read, or, or whatever the case may be, but we open up God's Word, and we simply just read Scripture, uh, you know, not necessarily attached to the sermon, although we do that within the sermon, but also just to, to read God's Word, and then we pray responsively, as Barbara and Jamie did this morning. So we, re we read Scripture. Another thing we do every Sunday morning when we gather is we pray. We have various different prayers that take place during the, during the worship assembly for various purposes and, and, and uh, ideas and things that we want to pray to God about. And that takes place every Sunday. And then, of course, we sing. We sing every Sunday. We sing different songs. Sometimes we sing songs with piano and guitar and drums. Sometimes we sing it a cappella as we did today. But we sing every Sunday. And then, of course, every Sunday we gather together and we take communion. At this congregation, we, we, we recognize that. We practice that every Sunday we come together. And, of course, after communion, we typically take up our offering every Sunday. And then, of course, every week somebody gets up. Usually it's me, but every week we have a sermon. We have preaching that takes place on Sunday mornings. And so these are the things that, uh, that take place typically every Sunday morning as we gather together for our worship assembly. Now, if you asked most Christians across America today to play the one of these things is not like the other game with this list of Sunday morning activities, it seems pretty clear which one is considered different than the others. There's one that maybe, I mean, theologically and, and mentally we say all, we, all these things are the same, but, but really there's one we've treated a little bit different. It's that one that's in the middle down at the bottom, offering. The truth is, is that offering has kind of gotten a bad rap in our country. 
It's become the inconvenient necessity of Sunday morning. And I'm not saying this is true for every individual. There are certainly Christ followers who hold to God's teaching about money and possessions and view offering as God is intended. But oftentimes, I think we've reduced offering to nothing more than a weekly fundraiser. We've even used the words separate and apart, right? That this is something different. This is separate from the rest of the service. This is the time we got to pass the plate so we can pay the bills and we can you know, do that sort of thing. And that's kind of how we treated it. We got it set, it's separated apart for the donations so we can pay the bills. And so we look at this picture and we can pick out which one is not like the other. But of course, you're a smart crowd and you realize that that's not exactly how God intended it. God intended us to see all of these elements in the same way. That in each of these elements, while different and unique in their own way, they all have the same exact purpose, and that is to glorify God and to draw us closer to Him. When we read Scripture, we do that so we can glorify God and so we can draw nearer to Him. When we pray, we do it for the glory of God and so that He can mold us to be more like Him. And we sing, it's about glory to God, but also, again, aligning our hearts with His. When we take communion, of course that's about the glory of God, but it also transforms us as well. When we, when we preach, when we, when we listen to a sermon, it's for the glory of God, but it's also for the purpose of making us more like Christ. And of course, that's exactly what God intended when it came, comes to offering. In the Old Testament, it's easy to see that God intended the giving of the tithe to be a part of the complete worship package, if you will, for the Israelites. As, as we've done throughout this series, I'm going to be going through a, a, a long list of Scripture today, so I encourage you to write them down and, and go back and look at them later. But Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 11 says, Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for His name, there you are to bring everything I command you your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, and all the choice possessions you have vowed to the Lord. And so right there, God is saying to the Israelites, when you come to the temple to worship me, there's some things you're going to do. You're going to give your sacrifices, your offerings, but then he also includes in there your tithes and special gifts. And even though the tithe was not commanded in the New Testament, as we talked about last week, God still considers giving to be an expected part of worship. If you look at Philippians chapter 4, Paul is writing to the church to thank them for their gifts and their offerings in support of his mission work. And this is what he says about the gift in verse 18. He says, I've received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And so Paul here basically says that your offerings, your gifts... They are, an, they are a sacrifice. They're part of worship. They're pleasing to God. They're a fragrant aroma to Him. And in all reality, I doubt that anyone would disagree that giving is a part of worship. And perhaps uh, more so than any other gift that we offer on Sunday morning, our gift to God in offering, it actually says something. In fact, we've talked about over the last few weeks that it's not just our giving that says something, but rather how we handle our finances and our material blessings in general, how we handle those things, it actually does say a lot. Money does really talk. Remember the quote I shared a couple of weeks ago from Ron Blue, who is a Christian financial consultant. He said this, you can't fake stewardship. Your checkbook reveals all that you really believe about stewardship. A life story could be written from a checkbook. It reflects your goals, priorities, convictions, relationships, and even the use of your time. A person who has been a Christian, even for a short while, can fake prayer, Bible study, evangelism, and going to church, and so on, but he can't fake what his checkbook reveals. That's so true, that money talks, and how we use our money speaks volumes. And we should keep that in mind in the entirety of our stewardship, but today I want us to talk about what our giving might say, if you will about us and about God. Have you ever really thought about a gift from someone or a gift for someone from the perspective of what that gift might say? I'm a husband. I do this all the time. What is the gift that I'm getting from my wife going to say? You know, we historically get into a lot of trouble as husbands for what gifts say. You know, if you get a vacuum cleaner for your wife's birthday, that may say get to work. If you get her a cookbook, that might say your cooking is nasty. 
If you, get, if you have a gift that's just thrown together at the last minute, that clearly says, oops, I forgot it was your birthday. And so what we give and what we say with a gift depends on what the gift is and who is receiving it. And when done right, there is nothing like a gift that says exactly what it was intended to say. A gift that communicates exactly how we feel about a person that we are giving it to. Well, the same is absolutely true about the offering that we give to God. When we give the way we should, the way God intended, it speaks volumes of how we view God. It's no question that God expects us to give, but I think there are, some, there are, there are four things that we're going to look at today that, that God wants us to say in our giving. The first thing is that God wants us to say to give in a way that says thank you. God wants us to give in a way that says thank you. In 2 Corinthians, Paul spends two chapters talking about giving, chapters 8 and 9. And specifically, he's using the Macedonian church as an example as how to give. And Paul talks about giving that is generous in spite of poverty. It's sacrificial. It's joyful. But before he mentions the characteristics of the Macedonians giving, he mentions the source of of their giving. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1. He says, "And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches." Now, Paul here says, he refers to the giving as the grace that God has given because he's he's going to talk about this grace that God has given the Macedonian churches and he's going to start talking about how they gave and the characteristics of that giving. And we might be tempted to interpret that to mean that God gave this church some special ability to give, but that would ignore the fact that Paul is using the Macedonians as an example that we and the church should follow. In fact, Paul identifies the grace he's talking about later in verse 9. He says this in verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich." Do you recognize that grace that Paul is talking about? This this is the amazing grace that we pray about. This is the grace that we sing about. This is the grace that we preach about every Sunday. This is the grace that is uh, the salvation made possible through the incredible sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so obviously, this grace is not limited to the Macedonians. It was given for everyone. And Paul takes the connection with God's grace and gift, and the gift, one step further in the closing paragraph of his writing about giving. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 13. He says, Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And so Paul connects giving and the acceptance of the gospel he says that if you, if you give the way God is intended, with the generosity and love that God expects in the way that God does, that people are going to praise God because you are aligning and you are matching, you are, you are accompanying, you are coupling your generosity, your love, which, by the way, is reflective of the God we serve with the most giving thing ever given, Jesus Christ. You see, that's the kind of giving God wants from us. The giving that says, thank you. But we don't want to get this confused. I'm not talking about a gift that's done to compensate for what God has done. That that we try to make up what God has done for us with our giving. That's not even possible. What I'm talking about here is is giving that reflects what God has given us both materially and spiritually. Last week we talked about how God wants us to give and according to how we've been blessed. We, we saw in 1 Corinthians 16 that Paul tells the church that each should give in keeping with his income. So in other words, in, a way to, in layman's terms, that the more you get, the more you should give. And, and in Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30, he says that each person should give according to his ability. And, and as God has blessed us materially, he wants us to give in return. But that also goes beyond, it goes beyond that blessing, that material blessing. Because giving in a way that says thank you means that when we think about how much to give, we think about how much God gave us when he gave his only son to die for our sins. And so our gift should accompany our confession of the gospel of Christ and our gift should reflect how grateful we are for that gospel. And so we should give in a way that says thank you. 
But God also wants us to give in a way that says, I trust you. I trust you. You may be familiar with this wonderful verse in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. And this is a wonderful verse that teaches us that God desires to trust us to trust him completely and fully, to not depend on our own understanding, to not depend on ourselves, but depend on God, his will, and his understanding. But what you may not know is that this wonderful verse of trust is connected to promises of blessing. The next verse, chapter, verse 7, says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. You see, that, that, that's the, the verses right after what we just read. A lot of times we'll read that verse and we'll say, Oh, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. But God has connected that to giving and blessing. It's by trusting in God and not ourselves and by honoring him with giving that reflects that trust that we will be blessed. For the Israelites, it meant honoring God by giving him the first and best of their crops. That's what the word first fruits means. To tithe as God had commanded. And for us, it means giving in such a way that we absolutely have to depend on God for survival and success. That's a pretty big bill to fit. To give in such a way that we have to depend on God for survival and success. To give in such a way that we're not trusting in our own understanding, but we're trusting in God. I think a lot of times that we have a tendency to trust in our own understanding in the way we give because we we treat it like a business. Here's what we have coming in, here's our expenses, and here's what we have left, and here's what we can give to God. That's not the way that God has called us to give. It's not the way. He said we need to trust in him. I I don't remember who said it, but a preacher at a ministry conference one time that I went to made a statement about faith in the church that has stuck with me and really made an impact on me. And, And you may recognize it, how big of an impact it made, because I talk about it a lot. I say it a lot. He asked this question. He said, if God left your ministry, would it change drastically? In other words, what he was asking is that if God withdrew from your ministry, from your church, would you continue to be able to do what you're doing or would it fall flat on its face because you were so dependent on God? And the point he was trying to make is that you should be doing things, as Lindy kind of said earlier, you should be doing things in your church, in your ministry, in your life, that if God said, I don't want to be a part of that anymore, that it would completely fail. That's the way we should trust and depend on God. Well, I think the same thing is true for the way that we handle our finances and the way that we handle our giving and our generosity, not just towards the church and to God's, but, but to, but to the, the, the people that are in need and all over the, the kind of uh, opportunities that God has given to us. We're to trust in the Lord with all our heart and not lean on ourselves. And so God wants us to give in a way that says, I trust you. But God also wants us to give in a way that says, it's yours. We've talked about this throughout this series, about how nothing we own is ours, that it's all God's. And we need to shift our view of ownership. And the truth is that God is the owner of everything. And we are simply managers of what God has blessed us with. And as 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not? He's saying everything you've got has come from God. And of course, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, we looked at that previously. It showed that God provides us the ability to earn money so that everything we have truly does come from Him. And so as managers, we must understand that the money and possessions we have are not ours to do whatever we like, but they are God's, and we should follow his desires. But the next step to that is understanding that when we we love someone, we start to care about what's important to them. I brought two things to show you today. These are the most romantic gifts I've ever gotten, my wife, okay? And you've maybe seen this before. I brought these up at different times before. But these are the two most romantic things I've ever got from my wife. This is one of them. It's a football card. You know, like they have baseball cards. This is a football card. That's the first thing. And here is the second most romantic thing I've ever gotten my wife. A brick. 
Now, she's not here, <laughs> so she can't confirm this, but I promise you she would confirm to you that these are indeed the two most romantic, I can't put that on my stand, two most romantic things I've ever gotten for her. Now, what it is, is I want to show you, first of all, uh, this is not an any, any brick, it's got some writing on it, okay? And this is actually a Dante Hall football card. And these are the two most romantic things I've gotten. And, uh, and this, this brick, by the way, it's a copy, a replica of a brick that is actually in the uh, walkway at Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City. So right now in Kansas City at Arrowhead Stadium, there's a brick just like this. And every time we go, once a year when we go to a game, we find that brick and we lay down, down next to it and have somebody take our picture. And uh, we, we haven't aged a bit in the 10 years we've been going, I promise you. So anyway, that, that, that's the other part of that. And you may have heard this story, but, and if you have, bear with me for a moment. But many of you know that Carrie and I are rabid Kansas City Chiefs fans. And that's one of our things that really allows us to spend quality time together. You know, a lot of couples have a lot of different things where they spend quality time. Ours is, is our football games. And when we go to Kansas City, it's the most romantic getaway we could either, both of us could either imagine, believe it or not. Forget Paris, take us to Kansas City. And so uh, the first time we went to, to a game, though, if you can believe it or not, the first time we went to a Chiefs game, we were not both Chiefs fans. In fact, uh, Carrie grew up in a household that rooted for the Chiefs' arch enemy, the Denver Broncos. And so the first couple of years that we went to a game, it would always be a Chiefs-Broncos game because it was a fun little rivalry. She'd root for the Broncos, and I would root for the Chiefs, and, and we'd be rooting for different teams. But something strange started to happen. When the Broncos would win, which was way more often than I'd like to admit, I would, of course, be sad. And Carrie secretly found herself wishing that the Chiefs would win because she cared more about me being happy than her team winning. Then 2003 came. And in 2003, Dante Hall ran a punt return 93 yards for a touchdown in the fourth quarter to beat the Broncos 24 to 23. And at that point, the secret could no longer be hidden because Kerry became a full-fledged, shout-out-loud Kansas City Chiefs fan. And so this brick, it reads, out of love, a new passion. And that's exactly what happened because Kerry loved me. She became passionate about what I was passionate about. And this football card actually has a piece of a game-worn jersey in it. And it happens to be the jersey that Dante Hall was wearing the day he had that punt return for a touchdown, the day that Kerry finally came out as a Kansas City Chiefs fan. And both of these gifts represent the moment that Kerry and I recognized that love led to a common passion. That because she loved me, she started to love the things that I loved. And by the way, there's stories that go the other way too, but that, that's the one that sticks out, that she came to love the chiefs out of our love. And that's exactly what God desires from us, that when we become his followers, he wants for his passions to become our passions. The things that he loves are the things that we should love. And, and we do that more and more as we grow, as we become more like him. And by the way, he also desires that we drop everything from him. Have you ever thought about that? Is there somebody in your life right now that if they called you on the cell phone right now, that you would get up and walk out and go be where they are if they needed you? Right? We have people like that. That if you Let's say that you had a, a, a fun trip planned somewhere, and this person called you and says, I really need you to be here with me right now. You would not cancel every, all your plans and be with them, right? We have people like that. See, that's the kind of love that God wants us to have for him. That when we love him so much that when God says, I need you here, that we put aside all of our own wishes, all of our own desires, all of our own plans, and follow him and serve him and, and, and accomplish what he has called us to accomplish. That shows when we do that, that someone in our lives is more important than our priorities. And that's what God wants from us. And when it comes to giving, God reveals some of his passions and priorities in the way that offerings were used in the, in the New Testament. Here's some things that we see that are passions and priorities for God. The first thing was to grow in the community of believers. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 45. I'm not going to read that, but, but it's the, the common verse where they, they, they were all together, had everything in common. And because of the giving of the people to one another and to the church, every, no one was in need. And it says, and the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. And all that, I believe, is absolutely connected. 
1 John chapter 3, verse 17, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity, how can the love of God be in him? And what he's saying there is that if you see a brother or sister in your church or someone who's a brother and sister in need and you don't have pity on them, how can you say you love God? Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. And so to grow the community of believers, not, and not just, not just to uh, take care of us, we have a holy huddle, but to, to grow the community of believers is something that God has called us to give to. That's a, a passion and a purpose that he has. Another one is to meet the needs of Christian workers. 1 Corinthians 9, don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. And all God's preachers said amen. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church are, well, are worthy of double honor, especially those who work, whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. And the worker deserves his wages. The concept of church staff, it started in part with elders who dedicated their time to preaching and teaching and leading, much like the role of a senior minister or a lead minister today. And this principle would certainly apply to ministers who direct the affairs of the church in various capacities. And this also, by the way, does not just apply to church staff, but also to those who are, who are missionaries overseas. We'll talk about those in just a moment. Uh, then, then we see that God's passion and, and purpose in giving is to meet the needs of the poor. 1 Timothy 6, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. In Proverbs 28, he who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. You see, there are many, many things that God cares about the recipients, uh, the, these, and these are some of the recipients of giving in the New Testament. And these are things that God cares about. And you know what's great about this list that we just went through? It's exactly what the offerings of Christ's covenant church go to. Exactly the same thing. Let's talk about that for just a moment. To help facilitate the growth of the community, community of believers, as we talked about before, both numerical, numerically and, spir and spiritually as well, to grow the community of faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you know what percentage of our budget the shepherds have designated as missions? 100%. 100% of our budget. You see, we as church leaders, we are committed to making sure that just as God calls us to be good stewards of our personal finances, that every dollar is used for God's glory. And the same is true for our church as well. It's our hope and commitment that we work towards every dollar we spend as a church going towards God's kingdom purpose of making more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. And to do that in the best and most efficient way possible. Every dollar that is given in the offering plate on a Sunday morning should directly affect the discipleship making more and better disciples. That's our commitment. That's our hope. That's our prayer. And by the way, with that commitment in mind, we've reduced the budget several years in a row to be more efficient for God's mission for us. To say we need to not spend in this area. We could be better stewards here. And we've reduced our budget year after year with the idea that we need to become better stewards, and, and, and to make sure every dollar we have is going toward the mission of God to develop missionaries here and across the world as well. And by the way, not only have we reduced our budget, but last year in the face of declining uh, offerings that we saw a trend late last year, we still, the shepherds still decided that it was appropriate to add a missionary to our list to trust in God and to say, we want to partner with Elijah Peters and his family and his work in New Zealand. I, I love that that was the case. I love that that happened. But every dollar should go towards the work of God's mission, again, both in our midst, but also with our other partners in Christ, which are 
offerings, which is why our offerings also go towards the second thing that God is passionate about in the New Testament when it comes to giving, meeting the needs of Christian workers. I'm happy to tell you that Christ Covenant Church takes care of their staff. And I want to thank you for that because I've been in places where that wasn't the case. In fact, I'll tell you a little story about that. One time when I was a youth ministry in a little church in Tologa, Oklahoma, uh, we took a little trip down to Dallas and partnered with Dallas Christian College to do an inner city uh, service project, basically is what it was, with a, with a bunch of youth group kids. And there was a couple of the elders on, the, on that trip with me. And it just so happened that they started talking about poverty in the United States. And they talked about the income level of poverty in the United States. And at this level, that's when you're considered to be in poverty. And guess where my salary fell? <laughs> I gave the elder a little nudge and say, you see that? You know what you pay me? But I'm thankful that I'm not in poverty here. That I'm thankful that Christ's Covenant Church takes care of their staff. And that's not true of every church, but we're blessed. But not only the church staff, not only does Christ's Covenant Church take care of their staff, but we also support missionaries like Jane Potta, Galeppi now, who works in Argentina to, to, to be with the, the people there, to, 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 to be a missionary to those people, to bring people to Christ. And again, as I said before, Elijah Peters, who's doing a lot of what we're doing here, he's doing there in New Zealand, and he's, he's bringing people to Christ uh, in, in New Zealand. Of course, we also support Tanglewood. And I don't know about you, but I went to church camp when I was a kid, and it's partially, in, in, in a lot, actually quite a bit, responsible for who I am today. It helped develop me, and I believe that Tanglewood is a part of God's mission as well. And we support Dallas Christian College as well on a, on a monthly basis. And I believe that Dallas Christian College is training men and women to lead churches and to, to, to make more and better disciples. And so those are some ways that we meet the needs of Christian workers. But also, the last thing that God was passionate about is in the New Testament was to meet the needs of the poor. And I'm, I'm happy to say that's a priority for our church as well that we support some other place on a monthly basis and we assist others in need from the community and, and, and you help others in need in ways that don't show up uh, in the bank account of the church. But that is a credit to our congregation. I really am. I'm proud of the things that God is doing with our offerings. And the truth is that our offerings do much more than just pay the light bill. God is using them to build his kingdom, to equip our entire congregation to become the church full of missionaries that God intended us to be for his glory. So when we give, we need to give in a way that says, it's all yours, God. And then lastly, God wants us to give in a way that says, I'm yours. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians for just a bit. Look at 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 9, verse 7. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, I could really take this verse and twist it around a little bit and make it fun for us. Because God doesn't want us to, to give if it's not cheerful giving, right? That God does not want us to give reluctantly. And so if I'm reluctant, I just shouldn't give, right? Isn't that what it says? And all God's people said, I hope so, right? <laughs> but that's not the case. This verse is not saying that what you give is completely up to you, that God has no expectation for our giving. This verse is not saying that if you're uncomfortable or nervous about giving that you shouldn't give. I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. Even though that we are taken care of as a family by this church and, of course, as my wife as a teacher, there are some weeks that giving is a tough thing. When house expenses or car expenses or kid expenses come up, that happens. And God's not saying, okay, Chris, you know what? If you have a rough time, if your refrigerator breaks down, don't worry about giving this week. It's all good. That's not what God is saying. What this verse is saying is that we have to give in a way that says to God, I am yours. Back up to 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 8, verse 5, where Paul is describing the gift giving of the Macedonians. He says in verse 5, And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, then to us in keeping with God's will. Let me tell you something, church. Once we truly give ourselves to God, the rest of it's not going to be a problem. If we truly give our heart, life, soul, if we love our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then the dollars in your bank account is not going to be as big of an issue anymore. If you've said to God, everything I am is yours, you do with me what you will. And if you mean that and you live that out in your day-to-day -day life, 
It's not going to be as big of a struggle to give generously in a way that says, I love you to God, in a way that says, in a way that says I'm yours. You see, the difference between giving out of obedience and giving reluctantly or under compulsion, it comes down to love. Let me give you an example. I've taken out the trash many times in my life. And Nate says, not as much anymore because I do it all the time, which is true. But I've taken out the trash many times in my life out of obedience and because of love. And I've taken it out reluctantly and under compulsion as well. When I was a kid, I hated to take the trash out. I hated to do that, but that was one of my chores. And so my mom would call me when the trash was full to take it out, and I usually did. But even though I loved my mom, I was not taking the trash out because I loved my mom. I was taking out the trash because I feared my dad. Because <laughs> I knew what would happen if I didn't obey my mother in that, if I didn't take out the trash. And so then I took the trash out under reluctance and compulsion. But fast forward about 20 years or so. And if my wife were to ask me to take out the trash, I would. But you know what? Don't tell her, but I'm really not that scared of her. It's not out of fear that I'm afraid that if I don't take out the trash, she's going to punish me or leave me. It's out of love. It's because I love her that I do that. I obey my wife's wishes because I love her, and God desires the same kind of obedience from us Certainly God understands that we will struggle with giving because of our selfish nature. And by the way, if my wife asked me to take the trash out, I wouldn't jump at the chance and say, oh, I'd love to do that, honey. Thank you so much for that opportunity. But I would be doing it out of love. And God knows that we're going to struggle. The giving is going to be a struggle because of our selfish nature. But he wants us to give in a way that says that you are the Lord of my life. And making him Lord means that we choose to obey him. You see, when we give in a way that says, thank you, and I trust you, it's yours, and I'm yours, you know, we can really sum that up in three words. We need to be giving in a way that says to God, I love you. That's what it comes down to. And of course, loving God in a concrete way is just what God desires our giving to be. Loving God in an active, concrete, discernible way is what we call worship. And that's exactly what God wants our giving to be. But our love for God is not the only love involved in our giving. The fact is that giving in itself is a gift from God. And that whatever you find, wherever you find giving in the Bible, you always find it connecting, connected to God's blessings. Malachi 3.10, the Old Testament. Bring the whole tithe in the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. And this passage was written to the Israelites specifically. God told them that they would bring in the whole tithe, which they weren't doing at the time, that he would open the floodgates and bless them beyond measure. And even though this verse only applied to Israel in the Old Testament, we're not left out. The principle still is the case because God wants to bless us in our giving. Look again what Paul says to the Philippians about how God will bless their gift in Philippians 4. He said, I've received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And this is the great blessing that comes with it. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. That God will meet all of our needs according to the grace that comes through Jesus Christ. And then look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians verse 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And I don't know about you, but even though Malachi doesn't apply to me, that sure sounds a whole lot like that Malachi verse. That if I give generously, God is going to bless me generously. Not that he's going to fill my bank account up but with blessings that truly mean something because they come from a God who knows what we need and he knows how to bless us in the best ways. The truth is that God absolutely wants to bless us and he's promised us to do so when we give in a way that says, I love you. And just as Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, whoever can be trusted with very little can be also trusted with much and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Church, God wants to bless us, and he does so when we manage the money and possessions he's blessed us with in faith to glorify him. I had to go back and I had to stop the servers before, because, you know, we kind of got into a routine here that we, before before the sermon, we do communion and offering, but we switched it up a little bit today. 
And the reason we did that is because I wanted us to take full advantage of what God has spoken to us this morning through his word. And today we're going to close with communion, and then we're going to close with offering. In just a moment, Mark is going to come and lead us in a time of communion. And during that time, we're going to be reminded of how God has so richly blessed us through his son. And then it's going to be time for our offering. And during that time, instead of having a one of these things is not like the other mentality and just knowing that we've got to pass the plate and put our money in, pay the bills, I want us to take time and reflect. I want you to stop and think before we take up the offering and as you give the offering or as you think about and pray about what God is doing in your life, I just want one simple question. The question is this. What is your giving saying? When you give, what does it say? What does it say about you, your faith? What does it say about your God and your belief in Him? Let's pray. God, you have so richly blessed us. and We can't put into words the many blessings that you've given to us. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to live our lives accordingly, to give accordingly in such a way that it ultimately says, I love you. That we should give in a way that shows our trust in you, that shows our love for you and our commitment to your priorities and our commitment to you being our Lord above all of the things. So Lord, as we prepare this time for communion and for offering, I pray you'll help us to reflect exactly on what God has called us to, what you've called us to, to see things the way you've called us to see it. In Jesus' name, amen.